Hi, this is Hallie Stephen Castro, and I'm just going to do the lecture of the eyes. Um, I just want to give the disclaimer that there are a lot of techniques that we do cover in this PowerPoint um, that you will not necessarily do or have to do either on your homework, for your assignment for Module 2, or for your um, head-to-toe assessment, your final um, assessment either. But we do cover them, so um, they might be you might see something on the exam um, and as practitioners you should, should be familiar with the, what these tests are and or if they're performed what they're why are they being performed and what the proper way to perform them so um, we do just kind of cover them even though they may not be part of your normal head-to-toe assessment okay all right, um, some equipment that we would need for an eye assessment, um, a Snellen chart, and you probably will not have access to one of those for this course, and that's okay, but most of you are familiar with the Snellen chart, and that's the picture of this chart right here with all the letters on it um, that you read from at least 20 feet distance, um, usually one eye at a time and then both eyes, and we'll discuss that in a little bit. Um, a pen light, everybody should have a pen light as well as their stethoscope. An index card or something to cover the eyeball would be um, helpful and we will not have ophthalmoscopes um, for you for this class for this summer. Um, the college has ordered some additional ones. If in the future you want to learn how to um, use an ophthalmoscope, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Dr. Nichols and we can schedule a time maybe this fall to kind of um, go over that when we get our new ophthalmoscopes in if you just want to kind of learn how to use them. But just be aware this is not, an ophthalmoscope is not something that um, a nursing uh, or nurse would use on a typical head-to-toe assessment or even a focus assessment in most settings unless they worked for a particular an eye surgeon or maybe in the emergency department or something of that nature. Usually a pen light and the Snellen and the index cards are probably about it to the extent of what you would need at, at most. All right, um, remember we're always gonna start with inspection. Um, we don't really do much palpation with the eyes, um, but we're just gonna inspect. Uh, expect the eyebrows, make sure they're symmetrical, make sure there's no issues with the eyebrows. Um, look at the orbital area as well as the eyelashes. Um, the orb or the bulb of the eye and the eyelids make sure we're looking at the frequency of blinking um, Sometimes make sure it's not too slow or not enough or too much rather um, uh, And you need should make note of that when you're doing your assessment Just review the structures of the eye the conjunctiva um, of the eye that's kind of like that connective uh, tissue or, or around the eye um, the cornea, which is the clear lens of the eye, the iris, which is the colored part of the eye, the pupil, which is the dark center, which we uh, tend to test a lot, and the sclera, um, again, that's kind of like the white part of the eye that goes into the, kind of um, connects into the, uh, the cornea, excuse me. Pupil gauge. Um, your pupils can range from anywhere from one on up to eight, um, and depending on um, how much light is available. Um, the less light, the larger in diameter the pupil will be. The more light you have, the less diameter it will need to be. Um, most eyes, if you have a lot of light or if you're using a pen light, you're going to be somewhere about a two. If you have a very little light or it's a very, very dim, it may be upwards of a six or more. So it just will be in conjunction with the amount of, of light you are shining into the pupil. <clears throat> Um, direct and consensual, consensual, excuse me, reaction to light. Um, this is when you take your pen light and you're going to shine it into one pupil and um, to see if it constricts. Not only should that pupil constrict, but the opposite eye should also constrict. Um, with so direct light, when you directly shine the light into the one pupil, it should constrict. And the other eye should have a consensual reaction um, to that light as well. So that's what we call direct and consensual reaction to light and this is part of your um, everyday head-to-toe assessment as well as your final head-to-toe assessment as well um, and just here's a couple of pictures um, she's using one on an infant and if you notice she does have the pen light that does have the um, 
the, the millimeters on it. Those are very handy if you do get uh, purchase a, a pen light. I do like those because they do have the millimeters of the diameter for the pupils so you can kind of measure. And here a gentleman is getting the uh, consensual and direct um, light to his eyes. If he put his hand up or someone put their hand up, the reason we do that is so that light from the pen light doesn't shine over into the opposite eye. So we know that the reaction that that eye is having is truly consensual. So that's why we do put the light hand up to block the light that's um, so it doesn't shine from one eye um, like to uh, reflect over to the other side. Um, a combination, again, we don't typically do a combination. This would be more um, possibly if, if they're checking for one of the cranial nerves. Um, but you're going to have a patient um, or sit in front of a patient, take an object, put about 12 inches out in front of their nose and slowly take it in to their nose. They should follow that object and their eyes should converge or come in together. And as it comes in together, those pupils should also constrict as they converge. They should get smaller as well. The peripheral vision, the confrontation test. Um, I do give an example of this in um, my uh, little video and Faye does as well in the training videos. Um, you want to conceal this, um, the same side of eyes. Like if I'm doing my right eye, my client's going to be the left eye so that we're facing each other. It looks um, so we're um, looking directly at each other with each uh, with the uncovered eye. Um, you're basically going to assess their peripheral vision, and we're going to come at them from all different directions, from the inferior, from the superior, from the temporal area, or right out from the side, and also the nasal area. Um, I did give a example of this in my video as well. Um, it's a little bit easier just to kind to um, show you how that's done versus trying to explain it. Uh, but basically you to extend your arm all the way out um, and then you slowly start to kind of wiggle your fingers and bring them in. And when your client can see your fingers, um, ideally he can see the fingers at the same time you see your fingers and that will tell us that the peripheral, their fields of peripheral vision are intact or within normal limits. Other neurological tests, and we don't typically do these always. Again, um, this would be something more for a specialized test. Um, the corneal light reflex, you're going to use a pin light, and you basically would have a client kind of a, like peer over your shoulder at something and an object about 15 and feet away. And it's how the light reflects into the cornea. We want the lights to reflect off both of those cornea, uh, off the corneas um, roughly at the same um, area. It's just to make sure that the client's uh, field of gaze is symmetrical. Again, this is not something that um, we would do or that you're going to be responsible for, um, but you should uh, just kind of just be aware of kind of um, what they would use that test for. Um, the cover uncovered test um, is a test that we have used in the past. This is a test that you would typically use a uh, index card with and you have the client cover one eye and you look at the opposite eye, the uncovered eye, and ideally that eye is going to stay aligned and straight and focused. If they have um, some malalignment of the eyes or um, like po possibly some strabismus or some muscle weakening, sometimes that eye may wander a little bit. So you test one eye at a time. You'd have them cover one eye. You're going to look at the opposite eye to make sure it remains aligned. And then you take the card down and you move it to the other eye. And again, making sure the opposite eye stays aligned. All right, um, the extraocular muscle test for your corneal light reflex. Um, the corneal light reflex, again, we probably would not have you perform for this, uh, or we're not going to have you perform for this summer. Um, the extraocular um, eye movements, we will do that. I do um, give an example of how that's performed. Um, and again, it will test cranial nerves three, four, and cranial nerve six. All right, so if you look here, um, it shows a basically kind of um, what I call cat whiskers. It looks like the star, kind of a star pattern across the eyes. Those are extraocular eye movements. Those are called the six cardinal fields of gaze. Um, and again, there it shows there, it accesses cranial nerves three, four, and six. 
um, it should have nice smoothness and coordination of movement um, for uh, for both eyes. Um, you're going to sit across from your client and you'll have an object in your hand and you'll have them follow that object and you're going to move your uh, that object in those same uh, fields of gaze. You're going to go all the way up and back down to the center, all the way out to the right and back down to the center, all the way down to the lower right, back to the center, then lower left, center, out to the left and center and upper left and center. So you'll hit all those um, six fields of gaze coming back to center um, and that will um, assess their eyes or that um, those extra ocular eye movements and we want those movements to be nice and smooth and coordinated um, <clears throat> and you can see here is a, a client uh, or a practitioner doing performing the uh, test with a client <clears throat> You can use your pen or you can use a finger. Uh, finger. Um, what would be abnormal is if you see really jerky eye movements. That's called nystagmus. Um, sometimes that can be induced due to um, medications or drugs um, or it could be some type of neurological problem. Um, so we're looking for any type of jerky movements with the eyes. They should be nice, smooth, and coordinated. And this is the um, cover uncover test. Again, you're going to uh, hold that uh, card up over the eye. Again, uh, normal if that eye stays covered and should, uh, sorry, then eye that is uncovered should stay within alignment, just like I did described um, earlier. And you would test both eyes. You're going to cover up the right eye and look at the left, make sure that it stays within alignment. And then you'll take your card and cover up the left eye and ensure that the right eye stays within alignment. If that eye starts to wander off, you may have some malalignment or some strabismus of the eye. Um, visual acuity testing, and this is just for a general vision testing. Um, this is when we would use that Snellen chart or the E chart. Um, if they don't know their letters, um, <clears throat> they can point up, down, or whichever direction the E is going. Um, with this chart, you need to have your client 20 feet away from the chart and they need to read the smallest line which they can comfortably read and whatever line that is that would be the vision uh for your client and remember normal is 20 20. Um, the top number is the distance from the chart so they are 20 feet from the chart and then the bottom number is the distance a normal eye should be able to see um, this test for myopia or um, impaired far vision like if they have uh, impaired vision from, from a distance or far vision. Near vision, and you don't see these as frequent, um, but this is called a Rosenbaum pocket vision screener. Um, generally, it's very similar to a Snellen, but instead of being at 20 feet away, that's a small chart, and you only hold it 14 inches away from the eye. And again, normal is going to be 14. 14, presbyopia, or having nearsighted or near vision um, would be anything after, um, it's more frequently in people after older, um, after the age of 40. <clears throat> the Ishiara chart tests for color blindness. You have probably all seen this at one time or another, and we have to be tested for color blindness for all of our nursing students as well as nursing instructors. Because some of the tests we do, um, we do have to determine color. If we're looking at the pH of a fluid uh, or whatever it may be, um, we have to make sure that we can uh, ensure that we can see colors appropriately. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully you can all see the colors unless you do have some color blindness. Um, you can see the 45 here, the 8 here, the 56, and the 29. Um, you would have your client identify those numbers in the circles. If they have difficulty identifying those numbers, um, then again, that, were, there, that would be a concern. Um, abnormal findings, again, for an eye exam. All right. Um, xanthelasma, they're kind of these orange yellow plaques on the eyelids or in the medial canthus. So they can actually be like on the um, inside, uh, kind of the inside, the interior, towards the midline of the canthus of the eye. They look like little deposits and they're actually um, related to cholesterol. Um, 
So that's called xanathlasma. And you should probably, I believe there's a photo in your book or um, to look for that. You've probably seen them before and just hadn't hadn't known what they were called or what they were from. But that's xanathlasma. Um, your ectropion, um, that's when the lowered lid of the eyelids turns away from the eye. Um, it kind of looks like a droopy eye, but you can really notice it it's really pronounced mostly with the eyelashes and um, that's why we should always when we do our inspection we are always looking at those eyelashes to make sure they don't have the ectropion or the entropion which is the opposite that's when that lower lid is starts to turn into the eye now ptosis is a drooping eyelid um and again um because of history of um a variety of medical issues we definitely want to make note of that but they should not have a drooping eyelid um that would be an abnormal finding and strabismus again is the malalignment of the eye um if one of the eye turns inward that's going to be esotropia if one of the eye turns outward that's going to be exotropia that's kind of like if one of the eyes is um <clears throat> is malaligned as compared to the other they should be nice and symmetrical and when they're looking um, directly at the same object they should be um, both be aligned uh, looking at that that object similarly <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> um, meiosis means that the pupil is constricted and fixed um, that can be for a variety of reasons. It can be a neurological issue. It could also be related to medications or drugs. Um, mydrasis is dilated and fixed. Um, that's a very concerning finding. Again, may related to a neurological inju injury or a brain injury. Also may be a medication. Um, Anasocoria is called unequal pupils. Um, and that happens frequently. Sometimes you can see it with um, people who have had a history of stroke. Um, sometimes if they've had surgery on their eyes. Um, so um, that would be an unequal pupil. Um, conjunctivitis, and, and most people have seen this or have heard of this at one time or another. That's what we, you know, plain terms called pink eye. That's the infection or an inflammation of the conjunctiva. Highly, highly, um, contagious um the exophthalmost is kind of like a protruding eyeball they really kind of and i, I hate to use this term but they call a lot of times they call them kind of like bug-eyed um usually it's because of an endocrine problem um and they have um an underlying health issue um that will cause that um so but that's called exophthalmos um just kind of who the only popular person or like a celebrity or a popular person that I know that did have some ex exophthalmos um, was Barbara Bush, um, President Bush's wife, uh, <clears throat> the older Bush. Uh, his wife had exophthalmos. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes you can find some pictures where her eyes were, um, they seemed like they protruded a little bit more. And cataract, that's kind of like a density of the lens of the cornea. Um, that's frequently seen in elderly people. Um, and that can be um, surgically repaired. Um, this is the ophthalmoscope. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, <clears throat> I will let you review this device uh, on your own. Again, we're not going to use those this spring. And again, typically nursing students or even nurses on the floor um, don't have to use these or don't use these uh, for their assessments. And I'm just going to kind of uh, move forward through this. <clears throat> when they do use the ophthalmoscope, a lot of times we like to look at that red reflux. And if you look at this photo here, um, these are the, uh, re the, um, the, this is the retinal arteries. And we kind of, and this is the little um, optic disc or the fundus. We just kind of have to uh, look at those structures in the eye. <clears throat> So pediatric considerations, um, again, they start doing those vision screenings somewhere between the age of three and five year olds, or uh, uh, between the ages of three and five. Um, a three or four month old is just usually able to fixate on something in the visual field uh, simultaneously. That's when they really start to be able to notice in or be able to pick out things in their visual field. Visual field. Um, the strabismus are being cross-eyed. Um, it could be because they have weak muscles or a constantly weak eye or it becomes like what they call a lazy eye. Um, they can typically kind of treat that um, with special glasses 
Um, in worst case scenarios, they may even have to have surgery to kind of um, correct that as children. And here you have um, a few uh, few of those examples. Um, you can see that uh, the eyes are not symmetrical and one of the eyes is kind of wandering off out to the side. Um, it's usually a muscle issue. On the bottom left, you can see they're kind of actually going inward versus outward. So endotrope versus exotropic. Um, elderlies, um, again, uh, we always kind of worry about their vision as they get older. Um, <clears throat> Uh, not only do they have to have, have, uh, are they far or the myopia or hypermopia, um, they also tend to have, after again, after 40, also have vision, um, problems with being nearsighted as well. Um, frequently they're having to require bifocals at that point. So, <clears throat> definitely when we talk to our patients, um, if we need to, we always have to, like, ensure that we know do they normally wear glasses do they have their glasses um and those types of things as sometimes those things are overlooked frequently um when we have our elderly clients in the um hospitals um just make sure that they have any assistive devices that they may need whether it be their glasses or hearing aids dentures and what have you um here's your elderly vision uh considerations you have your presbyopia which is decreased near vision again it starts about 45 years actually closer to 40 um and older uh they have poor accommodation and slow pupillary response it's a little bit more sluggish when you do that um when you use your pen light into their eyes their pupils don't respond quite as quickly um their night vision is not as good they have a decreased tolerance to glare um their peripheral vision it lacks as well and they do again start to have some trouble differentiating between blues and greens <clears throat> <coughs> whoops i'm having issues all right uh dry eyes um, decreased ear pro tear production uh, frequently as they get older. Um, sometimes they have to have additional lubricating drops for their eyes. Um, cataracts, we discussed, they get a little clouding of that lens. That can be corrected surgically at times. There's something called Arcus Senilius. Um, it's a white ring that kind of goes around the outer cornea. And you can see it a lot um, more prevalent in those that have darker um iris colors like brown eyes um it's usually it's a fatty deposit it's really from um, from cholesterol um the drooping eyelids it's called senile ptosis um it's more so it's not um necessarily related to a neurological problem it's um more related to as just um lack of collagen and the skin the eyelids just start to kind of droop a little bit um again they may develop that entropion or ectropion that's when the eyelash lashes will um come in or uh, where they will uh roll out and again the conjunctiva becomes a little bit more thin and may become yellowish in color all right um here is a uh concept map for the assessment of the eye I encourage you to just kind of look over your um, the study guide with your assessment to the eye. There's a lot of information in here. It's just kind of um, it's not necessarily something that you're going to use every day on a head to toe assessment, but it is things that you should be um, familiar with um, and what the normals are for your client across the lifespan. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and I appreciate it. Thanks.